All right, uh, we're supposed to have a train in this room, but uh, since they're not yet here, we'll just proceed with a round as um, advised by Orcom. So welcome everyone, welcome to the uh, welcome to round six of this year's Austral's. I'm Mikol from the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and I'm, I'll be your chair for this round. Without any further ado, let's start the debate, calling on the first proposition speaker, please. Here, here. Hello, am I audible? Yes. Okay. Yes. Right. Uh, hold on, let me just check if my teammates told me to say something. <laughs> All right. We think for far too long, the current system of political parties not only don't represent the youth's interest, but actually actively abuse them in regards to keeping systems that are bad for the youth and bad for their future opportunities. What does the world of affirmative bench look like? So we reject and just simply not support members of these traditional empowered parties and obviously the parties themselves. What then do we want the youth to do? I think the youth within then support independent parties that align with their views, whether it be the Green Party in the US or the Blue and White Party in Israel. So, but and I think that they are more likely to then uh, support these particular parties. But if there is no adequate alternative to the dominant party to support, let's say there simply does not exist, I think then, then the youth has to advocate for structural, systemic, and radical reform of these current traditionally empowered political parties. And I just as a caveat, even if they somehow also want to have reform on negative bench, understand that even if they want reform, they are required not to reject many of the fundamental inherent harmful things of traditionally empowered political parties. So what can't they do on negative bench? Even if they somehow want reform, they cannot reject things like gerrymandering, which gives those parties power. They cannot reject problems inherent to these problems, such as the, how the two-party system in itself can be incredibly underrepresentative individuals and they need to accept that the reform comes with the caveat of accepting a lot of maintaining the status quo policies. So I want to push the model that that negative bench needs to defend is to do the opposite of reject which is inherently support and not support but accept and although I will concede that they won't just accept and blindly follow these parties, you need to recognize that the criticism that they are allowed to give to the parties is through the lens of the party itself, which is inherently bad for the radical reform that we think it requires. I'm going to be running two things in my speech. First, how these parties are just unrepresentative of the youth and so the principled case as to why this youth should not be supporting them. And second, how then we change these parties to fix the problems of the youth. This brings me to my first point, how the parties are just underrepresentative and just unrepresentative rather of the youth. So notice that this is the principled case. We ought that we ought to give a avenue for these people and vote for the people that actually represent them and not just have to settle for parties that abuse them. Because given that this is one of the principles of democracy, such that you actually vote for the people that represent you, such that your concerns are validly heard. And notice that this uh, argument in itself is also independent of outcome. So I first want to ask, what are the unique interests of the youth now? So understand that the interests of the youth now exist a lot as a reform to the current system that is harmful to them. How do I know this to be true? Know that you, the young people now live in the most competitive economic situation that is bolstered by a lot of the current, um, in the current, in the current infrastructure and the current industries that exist. How do I know this to be true again? Notice that the youth now deal with less quality jobs because of things like automation that take away those jobs, but at the same time have to deal with the higher prices of goods, therefore making it very hard to live. Notice that the youth now also have received the brunt of environmental damage that a lot of the previous generations did not have to deal with and therefore has a unique concern to them. The next question then is, why do traditional parties have structural reasons not to cater to these specific interests? Two reasons. First, the vast majority of politicians in these parties benefit from the status quo systems. How do I, like, examples, right? Notice that the 
part people in the party himself are likely to be well-off individuals that had the competitiveness and the resources to be competitive in the party in the first place, which requires a lot of money in campaigns, which requires a lot of money to even get um, a position there and accepted into the party. So these people, and I think you will see even in real life, right, are owners of corporations that are the ones that are pollutative. They benefit from the lack of redistribution of land, for example, that would make living prices a lot cheaper for the youth now. So I think that is the first structural reason as to why they are unlikely to cater to these interests. But the second one is this, even if they themselves or these politicians themselves aren't the owners of all of these corporations, they are still forced to adopt these kinds of stances for the sake of the party. One, because the parties get a lot of funding and donations from these corporations and these industries, therefore they need to be able to adapt to those things. But also even if that wasn't true, and even if negative bench might claim that there are natural, uh, nat like, organic change that is going to come about by the change shifting of sense the more new politicians or more youthful politicians go into this party notice that newcomers themselves are also heavily compelled by their older politicians to also adapt these stances in order for them to gain power and seats in the party in the first place so even if they have the best intentions in order to be part of the party have the voice that they would need to be politicians in the first place they have to adopt a lot of these stances so I think this argument sufficiently proves why the current system of traditional political parties have many structural reasons not to cater to the concerns of the actual youth, meaning to say they are unrepresentative, meaning to say the youth should simply just not vote for them. This brings me to my second point, though. How do we change parties or the current political landscape such that we can actually cater to these problems? So notice all of the problems I gave you earlier that young people have really call for radical reform and sometimes the overhaul of entire systems in order for any benefit to accrue. And given that I've already given you reasons that the government, that the current government, for example, does not have the incentive to take such radical reforms, we don't think that it will organically happen on the side of negative bench. How then do we change these incentives? So first, I think, for example, if the youth rally behind another independent party, it sufficiently takes away the voter base of people of, for example, these traditional parties. Notice that this voter base is going to be increasingly important in the future as more of these young people come of age, as more of these young people become more politically active. So I think this is a good incentive for the current political parties to look at the fact that other independent parties are taking their votes and therefore shift and edit their stances such that they can actually cater to this very, very important voting bloc. But let's pretend that doesn't happen either and they still somehow win at the 60% instead of an 80% majority. The thing is, I think these like the large voter base that I'm talking about of the youth are at the very least likely to get local seats of power for other independent parties or other independent candidates. So they will be in town halls, they will be in like, they will be mayors or maybe even congressmen in these situations. Why is that good? So I think it's good that first, these smaller, like smaller areas and smaller pockets at the very least become representative of the youth. But more importantly, they, the politicians in the local level also therefore have more influence in the political discourse that exists. So I think it looks like bringing up these concerns to the higher officials of the state. It also looks like the fact that the mayor gets to be on TV or like the mayor gets to make certain addresses such that they can bring up a lot of the concerns of the youth at that point in time. So even if we do not achieve an entire overhaul of the current system, we at the very least give power to these smaller, like these smaller politicians that have then the capacity to bring up these concerns force, for example, other political parties to adapt to these changes as well. But this is where I'm going to go to the even if. Even if they will win overwhelmingly, or they still win and all of these things, why is this still, even if the traditional parties rather still win, why is it still important that we reject? If, for example, you significantly like take the win percent from 90 to things like 60, even if they win, at the very least, the mandate that party has and control it has over a specific area is significantly lessened. They don't have as much political impetus to create or perpetuate the current systems and status quo that are very abusive to these people. If you want a world where these youth, is, our youth are actually represented, but more importantly, get the radical change that they need, you're going to have to side with affirmative. Thanks. I'd like to thank the first proposition speaker for their speech. Now to open the case of the negative bench, we now call in the first negative speaker, please. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Three, two, 
want to. So what's the policy we support being part of youth factions of these parties, for example, being part of the Congress youth faction in India, B, we support voting for them, C, we support having internal reforms for, for example, being a part of the Democratic Party as a youth and asking for reforms internally, I'll mechanize this to you later. To, uh, later. First, a few rebuttals. So they tell you that a lot of the what you believe is something that is not in line with a lot of established party. That is simply not true. Look at the Democratic Party in the years. It supports free college, LGBT rights. It supports basic income. Look at how it has grown support for environmental issues. That is something that the youth literally cares about. So all they tell you is a bunch of lies about how these parties look like. Even if I don't believe you, first of all, if you're not able to win, win the election in the first place, I don't know how you get these changes. So on the point of their principle, that principally because we align with it, even if I believe you align with them, if you're not able to get any change that you want on a principal level, it's not okay for you to support these parties if the change you want doesn't actually actually happen, actually happen. They talk about structural reforms that they want. First of all, there's simply a bunch of lies. The current established parties do not support structural reforms. We notice that how Joe Biden has supported democratic structural reforms within the current US system, for example, ending Senate filibuster. B, if these parties are not able to win in the first place, I don't know how structural reforms happen. So first of all, I'm going to uh, tell you why rejecting this party is something that is going to be unfruitful and they are going to win either way. And this tactic clashes with their material that says that these parties will win. A, because notice that they have a strong hope between the political system. Why? A, because they have funding name and, pu name and popularity that is, has been established very well. Two, they have legacy, historical legacy that they have helped the country achieve independence or taken through an economic path. Three, they have such immense power that they can do gerrymandering. Even if opposition is able to get hold of, say, like one seat, they can just create a new GRC in Singapore. For example, the way PAP wins every election in Singapore, it's impossible to uh, it's impossible to beat the PAP because it keeps on gerrymandering. And lastly, you can always file charges against the people who stand against against you. The way B, uh, the way BJP and Congress do in India, and the way. PAP, uh, PAP does it often charges police uh, police charges against, for example, Reza Khan uh, in uh, uh, in Singapore of the Worker Party, the Worker Party, Worker Party. So how do we get change on our side, the house within uh, within uh, within this part, uh, party? So how do we eat the system? If we influence the parties within the system. How do we do? Uh, how do we do that? Because now notice that you are no longer a threat to the party, and often these parties are in power because they are often visionary and look in the long term what is best for the country. Hence, they are willing to listen to you as long as you are not in opposition to them. For the example, the way that you, that youth have convinced reforms within the Democratic Party to support things like free college, to support things like the Green New Deal, to support. Uh, to support homosexuality, for example, Hillary Clinton in the like early 90s used to be anti-LGBTQ. But because of youth being actively participating in the Democratic Party, this led to the Democratic Party shifting its uh, the shifting Hillary Clinton's view, shifting on gay marriage and actually actively supporting gay marriage. B, why is this not possible on their side of the house? Because you're an active threat to them. When you're an active threat to them, the PAP can just hold up its legacy and use its legacy legacy to legacy to argue against you to say that you are a threat to the entire integrity of the nation saying that you're a threat to the entire racial harmony of the nation and file police charges to you they are not willing to listen to you because they have huge power that they have they can use to just arrest you or silence you but when you are not a direct threat to them but suggesting reforms internally they are li more likely to listen because you are not displacing them for power but you also in line with their vision for better singapore or for better india for better better America in the future, in the future. So now I'm going to do two more things, tell you why these parties are good. And even if you do not believe that these parties, uh, even if you believe they frame that these parties will win, why are the new uh, new small parties bad? So why are these parties good? Because a, they have plenty of experience and they know how to deal with Republicans. Democrats know how to, how to negotiate with these Republicans that exist. B, they know how to get funding and support from various figures and uh, various figures. They know 
how to, they, they know how to negotiate when it comes to when it comes to Republicans. Because on their side of half house, even if I believe that these parties are able to win, they will we will be caught up in a deadlock because they do not have any experience of negotiating with Republicans. They will focus on ideological purity of the Green New Deal. That means that means that it will it will end in a semi deadlock and have no structural change, changes on their side the side of the house. The South has a house. Now, why are these new parties bad in case I believe that they are actually able to win? Yeah, because they are simply populist in nature. Because the, sim the only way to displace current parties in power, one single way, is to appeal to populist narrative, is to appeal to majoritarian narratives that these people have been very racist to the majority or these people are letting a lot of new immigrants in. That is what's happening in Europe. New parties are propping up, new right wing parties are propping up in UK and Europe. Why? UK and Europe on these Based on their stances of immigration, and there's something that is completely not in line with what the youth what the youth want. Even if they come in power, they will push for policies that are not in line with youth. For example, the uh, DSS in Jammu and Kashmir that is completely populist in nature, population in nature, and Islamophobic in nature. Its parties are often xenophobic, so uh, and hate immigrants. Let's uh, secondly, what they are, or secondly, why are they bad? If they are not populist, at best they are ideological. They are historically established, but never able to win the seats because they are ideological extremes. For example, the Communist Party of India. I believe that such parties that are ideological extremes are first of all never able to win elections because they do not know how to get a larger voter base to agree with them. B, B, they do not know how to give up give of certain ideals when it comes to negotiation. Hence, even if they win, they do not know how to push for uh, structural reform. See, ideological extremes means they are not able to weigh out the harms and the benefits of their policies, but only stick to puritarian principles and not look what's in look good for the best interest of the country when we weigh out what are the interests of the other side and completely ignore the interests of the uh, of other sides that do have some reason, that capitalist structures that do have some reasons to, uh, to exist. exist exist. Lastly, what are these parties? Look, last characterization of these parties are, even if you do not believe that the parties belong to these two categories, you may agree that a lot of these parties agree to single issue parties, because if the current parties may have failed in one single issue, or maybe working to change one single issue, but is not highly successful on them, they will try to win the seats by focusing on such issues. For example, the Green Party in Europe. Why are these parties bad? Because they do not weigh up, the, weigh up all the other issues that are important. The only thing they claim about is climate change. Climate change is important and it will get on our side of the house by reforms in the Democratic Party. But we also have to look for other things like immigration because the Green Party doesn't give a shit about that many Syrians are dying, many Syrians are Syrians are dying and not able to enter Europe. They are completely okay. Uh, they are completely okay with. Uh, they are completely okay about not caring about them. And these are important issues that you have to care about that they completely ignore. So what I have proved to you, the framing is simple. Given that it's very impossible because of the gerrymandering that exists, because of the power that these people have, people have because of the established legitimacy that these parties have, it's impossible to beat them. But at least on our side, the house, the youth will work within this parties to cause these structural reforms that they so want. It's impossible to get structural reforms on their side of the house when you get, when, when there's no way to get these structural reforms, we are able to win. At least we have some reforms on our side of the house. Our practical breach their principle. I've never been proud to be negative. I'd like to thank the first negative speaker for their speech. Now to continue the case of prop D, we now call in the second prop speaker, please. Here, here. Hello, can I be heard? Yes. Wonderful. Okay, I'll start in a bit. I'm going to do three things in the speech. First, I'm going to break down first Neg's criticism of our speech and explain why it's either incoherent or does not meaningfully rebut our material. Secondly, I'll be explaining why actually this is the most likely thing to solve our current problems now. And thirdly, why this is the best way to help people get out of poverty and fix mounting problems in society today. Firstly, what is first Neg's criticism of our case? They have two defining broad strokes. 
Firstly, they say democracy is fine, will participate in youth factions because clearly the party is adequately capable of representing the youth. And secondly, they are so terrible that they will arrest you and kick you out of society and lock you up in prison if you dare speak up against them. So these two are incongruous, but let's assume for the moment that they aren't. Why is it the case that their side has these things worse? Number one, their side has, these, has this worse because of the fact that these parties will continue to stay this way regardless of whether or not they want it to be the case. Because the fact that if the party is bad, not advocating for structural reform will allow the party to maintain being that way. But I want to note that this is a sneak. They are working in two separate contexts. They cannot say that the Democratic Party supports LGBT rights and it's fine to stay and say nothing about them, but also that, and also mention the PAP and say that it would be okay to maintain them in power since clearly they don't support LGBT rights. Broadly speaking, we believe that the youth are capable of advocating intelligently and without risking their lives. We broadly believe that. Well, I mean, aside from using proxies and speaking up online and generally trying not to get arrested, we also think that it will be difficult for the government to arrest people now, given the COVID crisis, as well as the outrage that it would invoke. Um, also, in addition to that, um, their points about how you will never win as a party, I think, preclude many of the existing preemptions we gave to you with Irene. We gave to you so many even ifs at first half, like we wondered if it was a bad thing, but apparently now they become, they're becoming useful because they're fully biting into them. So we gave to you three even ifs. The first was that even if you don't win on a national scale, you win on a local scale. For example, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez ran against a Democratic chair in, the, in New York's 14th Congressional District and won. For example, Bernie Sanders won as first as mayor of Burlington, then he won a, a, a seat in the House of Representatives. And broadly speaking, these were as independents and outside these political parties. So given that then, then that falls squarely under our side of the model, given that they broadly rejected these traditional politics, where are easy ways for you to get local representation uh, and work your way up to a national level. We don't expect this to be instant. The second solution is, and this was the discourse that Irene mentioned, they explain that parties will call you bad and engage in debates with you and say you're really terrible for society. We actually think this might be a good thing, for one, because of broad publicity for the party itself. So the idea that you get news coverage from gigantic news sites uh, that, that perhaps might be ideologically misaligned with you, but expose your views to the nation mean that you get overall more support and more cover from other individuals. But the third and most important thing is a concept called asymmetrical domination. Even if you don't win, and even if you don't convince people, what you do is you force people to talk about your issues. So when you present an issue like UBI, or when you present an issue like the Green New Deal, you force people to seriously consider the ramifications of serious problems, such as, again, automation, such as, again, climate change. So broadly speaking then, why are these solutions way better when you reject the traditional party than remain within the party confines? The first is, um, so uh, uh, here I've transitioned from formally responding to the previous speaker's criticism to now presenting my own constructive. And the first reason why this is broadly better is because you can uh, uh, operate without the party controlling you, operate without fearing the party's reprisal. So in a situation where you're within the youth faction, you have to solely stay within the party line. Otherwise, you're breaking party unity. Otherwise, in, for example, in the UK or other parliamentary systems, you might get hit with a three-line whip So and, and get kicked out of the party. So as a direct result, you're forced not only to stay loyal to your political allegiances, but you're also forced to stay loyal to whatever political backers and sponsors you may personally have. The second thing is, com uh, comparatively, you also stand to benefit a lot from the centrist position, from taking a centrist position because of the fact that um, because, because staying in power will also benefit you and get you give you a lot of money and political power. So broadly, speak, uh, so broadly speaking, you have an incentive not to speak up about problems that might be meaningful. Given that then, we think staying firmly outside of the boundaries of the party, rejecting traditional politics, and ensuring that your voice is heard is the best way to get solutions done, even if you don't win, and even if all the mechanisms NEG presents are true. That's the first part of the speech. I guess I kind of hedged the second part in it. So we'll move to the third part already, which is why we make a better society for everyone. First, I will address a few criti uh, criticisms again, so not explicitly within the issue. 
Um, the first thing is they say that you will focus always on ideological purity as a solution. So this is there's just like kind of an assertion as to why ideological purity is the only thing the youth care about. Like ideological purity is not an exclusive to the youth just because you think that the existing world around you is bad and you shouldn't be operating within the system because you don't think that's a pragmatic solution doesn't mean you're forced to only go communism or die, nor is it an inherent characteristic of the youth. Um, the second thing here is the party is bad because it is inherently populist or creates other populist. Populists. The first thing is, I believe that the youth are capable of selecting um, parties intelligently, especially independent ones. Like I sure, I'm sure that we like we made some mistakes before, but we've also did a good job with like Bernie Sanders. But broadly speaking, the alternative of supporting Joe Biden is also pretty bad. He's a sexual harasser. He's firmly a centrist, and also he's done war crimes in the Middle East. So I don't think that the alternative of Democrats are also are, are just as good, even if they might be comparatively better than Republicans. But the third and most important thing is that again, given all the pressing problems you mentioned earlier, they require radical solutions, not just simple uh, ones that away from the center in a minor way. Given that then, we think that it's broadly good for the youth in two ways. The first is that um, these problems will concatenate and scale towards the future in a way that will know that they can no longer handle. Like we're talking about mounting, uh, mounting education debt. We're talking about COVID and potentially future plagues that might get really, really bad. We're talking about climate change, which gets more, more expensive to handle as time goes on. And as such, they require radical solutions now in order to solve these problems and in order to prevent people from experiencing these harms into the future and having a minor change in excise tax or in carbon tax will not solve these things. It is about introducing radical solutions that can pull moderates away from the center gradually. And even if not that, again, have people talking about the discussion that might get somewhere versus working within the center that people are already benefit from. Remember, Democrats benefit from not solving climate change too because they also own businesses. So that's the end of the first Part, uh, some part of this issue. The second and last final thing I will discuss is why this is a better solution. So again, I, I flagged the mech quite a bit earlier, but I just want to point out that their criticisms to our mech have solely just been that the youth are bad and the youth will never, never win. So I want to note that accepting the existing traditional politics of today is comparatively worse for three reasons. Again, the first is that you cannot advocate for any of these solutions if they work outside the confines of the party boundary. The second thing is that if it is the case that the party is so strong, then gradually they will migrate towards conservatism as the people that uh, the people that are within the party and the people that control power in the party grow older and older. But the third and last thing is that there is a problem of political succession when there is conflict over the ideals of who gets to take on the legacy of that previous party. We would instead not co uh, compete with older people for the right to inherit the party's legacy and instead simply create a space of our own. We believe in the youth, but more important, more importantly, we believe in creating a political system for the youth and we don't think the current one is right. For these reasons, you must affirm. Thank you. I'd like to thank the second prop speaker for this speech. To continue next case, we now call in the second negative speaker, please. Here, here. Hi, am I audible? Yes. All right, just give me a second, please, and then I'll begin. I think that one thing that affirmative absolutely cannot get away with is their lack of a policy, right? The fact that they try to sneak away this case by saying that we as the youth, if we cannot obviously support any party that has an interest, will advocate for structural reform. This is important to note because it's absolutely impossible for them to do, right? Recognize things like democratic reform, which looks like ending the Senate filibuster, ending gerrymandering, ending vote suppression can only happen from within the houses of parliament, right? Can only happen when you're actually within the Senate, when you actually have power. Given that we or negative can prove to you that we are never going to be able as 
the youth to be able to get into power, it is impossible for them to say that structural reform will happen. These things, given that they are structural reform, obviously have structural reasons because of which they still remain within society, because of which this is an unfair democracy that runs on political dynasties, that runs on party politics, that runs on traditionally empowered democracies. And let's do a very important bit of framing for this debate as to what these traditionally empowered democracies look like, because that is something that affirmative does not want to engage with when we characterize this, right? Firstly, we think that the people or the way that these these political parties are perceived are as being status quo and being status quo always, right? Which means that the possibility of an independent party within the United States or another party actually winning the Singaporean elections looks something that is very alien to these particular people on the ground in and of itself. You go and ask any random Kopitiam uncle in Singapore, he's going, well, yeah, PFA is obviously not going anywhere because they have been in power for 50 years. Why is this true? Because these are people who have actually a part of the national fabric of the nation, right? Think about like Lee Kuan Yew within Singapore, who was seen as a visionary leader, thinking about the long term, thinking about sustainability, which means that this democracy has been hegemonized by these particular people. Think about the founding fathers of the United States and how they thought that only two differing ideals could exist. You're either leftist or you're either rightist, which means that you have Democrats and you have Republicans. At a point in time when these particular structural systems have made it absolutely impossible for you to win, we think that the side that gets you actual any change on our side of the house is the one that wins, right? Thirdly, the opposition in itself agrees that they can't get shit within these particular democracies in and of itself, right? This looks like in Singapore, fresh out of an election, the opposition saying before the election that we know the PAP is not going to lose. We know that we cannot obviously form a majority. What we want to maybe do is keep you in a check and balance system. What we want to maybe do is work in the same way as you, but take a half step left in and of itself, just to make sure that we are actually doing this to maintain a democracy in and of itself. And then lastly, we think that what's very important note is that these traditionally empowered democracies themselves are not going anywhere because of the fact that they have structural incentive to remain their political dynasties that actually come in. Let's actually rebut something that come up, right? This random principle, which they don't really run very well, in my opinion, which actually goes, goes to say that, ah, now you're seen as being sleeping with the enemy because Joe Biden is a sexual harasser. I think there are two responses to this. The first one is because you're in a coalition, our stance is very simple. Because you're in a coalition, because you are a part of their youth factions of these particular parties, doesn't mean you stand for or you support everything that the party has. What it does mean, however, is two things. One, you can utilize party resources, party legitimacy, party establishment. This looks like campaigning funds. This looks like super PAC funding for the Democrats and Republicans. This looks like all of these things that you can, which you can utilize. Secondly, you have a veneer of legitimacy to say, I am a Democrat, I am a Republican, I am a part of the PAP youth party, which means that we have been in power political uh, power for more than 40 years now. That's what's important. The coalition does not mean you support everything that the party stands for. What it does mean, however, is that you are using that party's name to forward your interests and possibly become the forefront of the party. Right? Second, sec the second thing is that your principle doesn't stand in this debate, right? Because that principle hinges on the fact that this is going to be a fair democracy wherein a political party in power and an opposition have an equal chance of winning. At a point in time where these are traditionally empowered democracies, which we claim are essentially non-democracies because they have literally like systems based on single party systems de facto, we think it's at that point in time when your principle does not stand the moment you are you have to be able to fight a bad system from within the system. That's the simple stance. Then let's think about what characterization of the youth factions. Right? We think that the prominence of these youth factions, young people have taken part in these politics. Look at a country like India where almost 60% of the voter base is under 30. The difference is that I know what they'll say. They'll say, ah, but if there are so many voters right now, then how come they won't just vote for the new youth party? It's because these people have been indoctrinated by their parents. These people have seen establishment as being a part. They have grown up seeing the PAP being in power in itself. They think there exists no other alternative. They know there exists no other alternative. We have to work within the system, right? Then how are we going to do this? And this, this is going to talk about some of the other things that are coming up from their side of the house, right? They say that, ah, but PAP don't support LGBTQ policies because that's apparently not what the youth want. We say, no, that's not true. The very reason why Pink Dot in Singapore is actually an establishment or the very reason why there is actually a lot of discourse and discussion is because the youth faction of the PAP was able to convince the old farts within the Congress, within the Parliament, because they actually had those sort of seats in and of itself to actually ensure that they can bring in some change. That is where you get marginal and gradual change on our side of the house. Right? That is where actually these things happen. If they have success stories of Bernie Sanders and AOC, who apparently didn't even make Parliament, we have success stories too of youth who actually bent in from within the system. You have to then judge this debate on which side is being more logically persuasive on where you can get more change. Very simply, two things in this speech. The first one is why rejection of traditional parties is bad. And the secondly, 
while working with these parties is more likely to get you change in and of itself. Right? Why rejection of these parties? Are? Firstly, because these parties have legacy value. The moment you actually go against them, you are likely to be seen more. Uh, you are likely to be seen as going against the more popular party. So you're likely to be seen as a threat. These are the parties that actually have the senior citizen vote. These are the parties that actually have the vote of the people on the ground because they're seen as establishment. Secondly, we think that the re rejection that you do to these particular parties is going to be based on establishment. They cannot just say that this rejection is going to look like actually standing as another political party because this rejection, the word rejection in and of itself, implies that you're going to speak actively against them. You're actually going to have media statements against them. You're actually going to ensure that you are calling them out for the certain policies that they have. And they are not going to sit silent because these are people who have 83 out of the 93 seats within a country like Singapore. And you as a random independent youth political party are going to get absolutely crushed, right? Because your protests are going to be based on the fact that these are political dynasties in and of itself. This is important because then they can silence you because they are seen as more visionary. They are seen as better individuals. They can just call you youth punks who don't know shit and who are just like millennials who have absolutely no experience, who have absolutely no wisdom in and of itself. And that is what we feel is important. And that narrative is more likely to sell, which means you will not be able to get into power. Secondly, the second reason why you will not be able to get into power is because these democracies work on a system of negative partisanship, right? Which is to say, let's think about why Bernie Sanders actually didn't become an independent candidate in the United States. Because he knew the moment he does that, and because the youth themselves also function in that way, in a liberal way, your Republicans are unlikely to shift, which means all you're doing is you're taking away votes from the Democratic candidate, and Trump is still going to win. There is a system of negative partisanship that exists, which is to say that it is not sufficient to prove that your policies are the ones you want, but rather it is sufficient to prove that the other side is shit. So insofar as Trump can just say that all those people are leftists, all those people are shit, they are still going to be the ones who win on the, their side of the house. So the difference then is they are not going to get any sorts of checks and balances. And I'll tell you why it's much better on our side of the house. Think about illiberal democracies within de developing countries. Like all these things like gerrymandering and voter suppression that these people do in and of itself is something very, very important because this means that now they are going to suppress your vote. They're going to suppress your voice within parliament because they're able to utilize things such as the Senate filibuster. You have a much better chance being part of the Democratic Party and being able to convince people like Biden to actually vote for structural reform, to actually lobby for structural reform, right? Why then can you get change on our side of those? One, because you're seen as relevant, because you're with these people, you have a veneer of legitimacy of being part of the PAP. Two, and very importantly, you have a bargaining chip within these parties, right? The difference is now that if you leave this party, as we saw happening in Kashmir under Sayyid Ali Shah Gilani, you are seen as being rejected from within the same party. So you can go out and say that these fuckers rejected us, which is why now we are actually having a youth party. And that is where you will sway the youth vote a lot more, right? They want to talk to you about things like climate change and whatnot. We think it's much better and we give you the mechanism that this sort of climate change happens on our side of the house, the moment you can get scientists to talk for the PAP, to talk for the Democrats in and of themselves and actually convince the people who are the fence sitters, the people who are the swing voters to actually then vote for your ideals gradually for change, for actual marginal change on our side of the house. We think it's much, much better that you vote for these political youth factions, not rejecting the established parties. Proud, proud to oppose. I'd like to thank the second negative speaker for their speech. To conclude the constructives of the prop side, let's now call the third prop speaker, please. Here, here. I'm testing my microphone. Can I be heard properly? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Just give me a moment. There are three issues I will focus on in this speech. Number one, why is the internal reform mechanism impossible and insufficient at negative? Two, how effective is this rejection from affirmative? And three, why is it still principally just to have the rejection of these parties? Firstly, why is the internal reform mechanism insufficient at negative? So second negative creates this argument that we can never change the status quo, that there's party resources, there's super PACs, there's so many ways that we will divide the vote and they're only gonna be the establishment that's continued to 
gonna win no matter what. And therefore, we have to follow this real politic model of trying to give in. That is the lie that the youth have always been told that second negative concedes to. He concedes that most of these individuals were indoctrinated by their parents that, oh, you can only vote Democrat and Republican because all parties and every other party will always lose. So you have to fall in line so that you have to give up, that you can never dream to be progressive. You can never dream to be radical. You can never join a social movement. You can never protest out in the street. But in contrary, that is the lie that they have been told. And it is factually untrue. 60% of Indian voters are from the youth. And as he concedes, if they will not vote for Modi, then Modi will lose. And you can have a youth party win. It is the youth who have been able to at least try as much as possible to sway these votes internally within parties. It is allowed ourselves to change these support structures of these parties. It allows ourselves to gain concessions. It also allows us to join social movements and also protest out in the streets. It also allows us as much as possible to gain some structural change in other ways because we vote, but not because we fall in line and then wait for the progress afterwards. They said that, no, 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 no. It's so much possible for us to get this change in any other ways. Like he concedes that most of these individuals, for example, can try to you know divide a party. And if they go to somewhere else, they're going to do that. But it only works in collocated within a two-party structure, right? In the vast majority of cases that negative pre pre presents to us, most of these individuals from the youth will influence party politics and aren't only going to vote for random parties out on the street. There are many reasons as to why their alternative doesn't work. Second negative says that, oh, there are youth arms that can always uh, allow ourselves to work within the structure of traditionally empowered parties. Those don't work for three reasons. One, because they also tend towards moderate centrist policies that privilege the establishment. They do this by trying to stay in power as much as possible because they want to keep the Democrat establishment in power. They're vulnerable to political capture as well. There are two examples of this. One is the Chacha League for the Youth Army and the Awami League in Bangladesh that has so much oppressive power and so much sway in different universities that they coerce different youth students to vote for the Awami League as well and are unable to try as much as possible to move to other progressive parties. We can change that because all of the youth can have a consensus in our side and disassociate from those political establishments because they don't have to choose between two parties. They are able to choose their own party that represents them and are able to have more critical mass. Two, the other example is like if you look at the youth arms of the Republican Party Party, they are also led by the likes of people like Charlie Kirk. Like those examples show that internally the youth have lesser and lesser options precisely because they don't have this consensus that we are giving at affirmative. You reduce those options with a two party system, especially with youth arms within moderate parties that also limit their options. The second reason is this even if you try to make centrist moderate politicians become more progressive, like the example they gave about Biden suddenly becoming more progressive, remember that is only predicated if you already concede your vote initially. Note what happened, right? You had a lot of Bernie Sanders give in, like they stopped becoming Bernie or bust, right? And then they gave in to vote for Biden immediately and then they pledged their vote and a lot of these individuals endorsed Biden because they said that was the only option that you have now. Why does this mean it was already a significant concession that diluted the interests of the youth? One, because Congress already was able to give up most of the sway that they have. Congress is already composed of moderate politicians and people who will not vote for Medicare for all, even if most of these youth wanted Biden to support Medicare for all, but there's impossible to pursue those policies because you're already going to be okay with the private option. Two, that most of these moderate parties will still accept money from corporate lobbyists and the rich, and so most of the progressive taxation policies and redistributive policies you want or the structural changes you want will not be voted on because Congress is filled with those moderates, at least on our side, right? Remember the difference. We are able to get structural change because in local primary elections or at least in the election of local judges or the election of local politicians fewer and fewer mayors, local government units can have structural change in places where the youth can have some significant sway. That is the changes we have because if you want the Green New Deal, it can't be zero sum. It can't be win or all lose. We can have some progressive change because on their side, they get the failures that will always be endemic. The last reason is this, they can't change the internal structure of these different political parties if you stay within them because of super PACs and party reasons as well. Like they concede to all of this. They're not giving a pathway towards concessions internally within these parties so just reject them
Second issue, how effective is then rejection? So there are two re reasons that they did, two examples that they gave, such as like single issue parties, independent parties not working. There are two reasons as to why these are effective. One, single issue parties are often extremely successful in these democratic parties or in the, within the structures of you know political establishment where there's a traditional political elite right like the examples that we gave such as andrew yang pursuing ubi that's a single issue policy right or even Ber bernie sanders being single issue with respect to medicare for all and never diverting to other issues does give discourse an argument we gave from second half unrebutted from second leg but we say secondly if independent parties and the single issue parties are are weak now and if they are really populist and racist now that is not a function of the disassociation of the youth it actually can be resolved if the youth are the ones that join these independent parties and will be the ones to give them more bolstering and critical mass just imagine if all the hong kong protesters would form their own party and allow themselves to try and vote out the elite or at least try to vote for some political change that might be meaningful for them that protest is so impactful in our side or if all black lives matter people had their own political party or if they would do that hey isn't that a race-based party isn't that a single issue party aren't those things that you also support that negative these also work these are structural reasons that these types of parties will be successful because the youth can align with them we have a clear path to success for many reasons one on our side political parties will be forced to decentralize power because we are the ones that have more sway two even if they still win they have less leeway to change their current structures which means they don't have the mandate we have time in our side we will win in the future and therefore we are better second leg says that no we still can't change but they will split still split the vote one unresponsive to all of these mechanisms and why the youth can still have structural change and critical reform but two yes why not split the vote now than later because it is more important to split the vote preemptively for many of these individuals because that is how we can try and reduce their political sway because it shows there's a decline in support Last issue, and this is the principal issue that they did not respond to. These political parties and the structures that they represent and the combination of all of these empower themselves to be inherently oppressive against the interests of the youth. We gave you three reasons. One, the oppressive systems of campaign finance encourage an elitist and modern political class that cannot adapt and disassociate from big money. Two, that this discourse is collocated within current structures of a two-party system, an electoral college, or first-past-the-post voting, which will not change these voters. But lastly, because of climate change, we will all die in 50 years. You cannot vote for any party that is never going to change their interests now, and you're going to have to wait longer and longer. We need to be able to have these radical changes and just not settle for any less. We are principally just to be able to reject these parties because they will never represent us. I'm very proud of those. I'd like to thank the third proposition speaker for their speech and to conclude the constructives of the neg uh, next side. It's now called the third negative speaker, please. Here, here. Starting my speech in three, two, one. I'm going to talk about two main issues today is which side better achieve the changes that the youth want. And secondly, how it's likely that traditional parties on our side will likely, you know, listen to what the youth, youth have to say, right? So I think the first thing that they want to talk about is structural change because they brought up how, you know, it's extremely unlikely for youth then to, um, to raise issues due to existing structural impediments to the current political system. Note that this happens on both sides of the house, and all they but they haven't actually told us how you know supporting independent candidates or fringe candidates, which are having you know which are viewed as one of the most radical candidates in the current political system, can actually allow them to you know garner widespread support in the political system or even change it in the first place. Because I think it's through working with the system that we are able to gain such forms of widespread change. And this is why it's extremely important to side with us because on our side, we show you the most effective ways youth can mobilize their political capital and resources 
to get what they want, right? How is it likelier then that we have structural changes on our side? It's extremely untrue for them to tell us that by continuing to side with the traditional party power, that we do not want any form of structural change, that we must be for the extremely undemocratic, you know, two-party system in the US, filibustering or, or filibustering or gerrymandering. We don't think that this is the case, right? We think that these are structures that have been in place due to historical, um, due to historical reasons and not exactly due to, you know, like, you know, incentive of the party. This is why we think that it's extremely meaningful for these individuals and youths to join existing parties, which are the only mechanism to which you can change these extremely undemocratic structures, right? This, this means that, and you see this through, you know, like Joe Biden actually one day removed the Senate filibustering, right? And this means that you can only achieve such changes by allowing, um, by supporting and rallying with, um, you know, current politicians, in, in the incumbency, right? So so then with, with, the ex, with the existing structural changes then happening on their side, given that they are completely unable to change, what are the benefits that they brought us from their policy? Number one, in the worst case, right, we told you that if it's in illiberal democracies or, or, or parties with, um, you know, over control over the force, let's say in Trump now, that Trump now, you, you get these, it, these individuals have a higher tendency to get arrested, right? But I think more, more, more of their best case would be then these individuals instead get slammed as overly radical and overly radical. And why is this the case? Because we told you that incumbent parties already have a lot of political uh, le legitimacy, a lot of resources and legacy in order to mobilize the moderate or more conservative or boomer or citizen vote, uh, senior citizen vote against the youth, right? These are, these are two completely different groups with entirely different set of values and ethos, right? And it's likely to then slam these individuals as not wanting the best for society and hence delegitimizing their views in the first place, right? At most, they say you get local support. And what comes out of their local support, you get better media coverage and people talk about them. But let me tell you that this is the furthest they can go. The furthest they can go is to get discourse for that. Because what have they told you? They're the next step they told you is to then vote in, you know, uh, more independent candidates, candidates like Joe Biden, right? And they told you about, you know, wanting to split, split the vote now. But we don't think that it's actually, we don't think that voting in Joe Biden can, uh, no, sorry, not Joe Biden, sorry, uh, Bernie Sanders, right? But we don't think that Bernie Sanders or AOC can effectively then lead, um, lead to the legislative changes that they want in the current, current political system. Why is this the case? Because we told you that the current political system is dominated with the hegemony of the two parties in power, right? This means that in Senate, you need to have like a majoritarian politician in order to pass bills, in order to be ratified and be endorsed by the executive, right? It's highly unlikely then that these minority candidates will be able to raise the issues that you want in, po you want in politics and get widespread change. So this is where we establish on outside the house that at most the change that they have is greater discourse and greater awareness. But that, that only stops there. It doesn't then it doesn't then allow them to achieve anything else, right? But, but then let me tell you why is it more effective on our side for them to do. Because they told us that it's unlikely that in government governments would then want to actually engage um, these youths um, on their issues, right? Because they have a lot of horse trading and stuff like that. And we don't think that this is untrue, but 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 we think it's even more likely on our side that we will be able to gather change. And why is this so? Because it's because it's likely that um it's likely then that the parties do not feel that they're under siege, right? They continue to have the comfort of having the youth votes. That, that, that is what motivates them to want to continue advocating for change. Why is this um yeah, continue advocating for change, right? But we think that even if that is not the case, right? We think it's extremely bad beneficial for youth to actually join the youth wings of these incumbent parties to then to then better enter politics in the first place. Because no, right? On the other side of the house, the, the only way that these youths can campaign for change is to let's say vote for an independent candidate or, or rally on the streets, right? We don't think that's exactly effective in today's status quo. We think that only through going through an incumbent party who have already widespread support or widespread campaign funds that that if these youths are able to go in there, first, they're able to generate connections, right? Like, so they talk about how there are really inherent incentives for the Democratic Party, but we think that all these parties will eventually evolve one day, right? Because as much as, in order to tender to, like, the future objectives in the future. So this, this means that the youth of today are politicians of tomorrow. This means by effectively allowing these youth to get into parliament, parliament or in the first place, allows these youth to actually tap on the existing voter support that they have, that the party currently have on their side. This means that youth are more able to reach out to the moderate or the swing voters in order to garner legitimacy for their talks about climate change or homosexuality. And this is very important, right? This, 
um, um, and and this is extremely important, right? That we are able to that we are able to allow youth to actually actualize or generate connections in the first place by being in the existing party. We don't think that they actually garner any they garner any change on the other side of the house. Why have we also told you that these youths can then become bargaining chips, right? By by showing to incumbent parties that they are able to rally a huge amount of individuals that that um that side with a certain issue right because the current system is there that incumbent parties feel no need to pander to use and their views because they are viewed as being radical because they are being viewed as having no threat to the political party but by having you know um youth wings you're able to show them there are actually voices within the establishment that think that this is the case that it's not separate that youths are not separate and we do not have a whole radical youth faction that wants something else from the from the general youth population, right? That's how we are able to then go ahead and actually push for some legitimate and credible change, right? So I think that that is um that is entirely true. And we don't think, like don't 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 let them buy you in about the talk about oppression. So even if we do not get our best case, right? Even if the current political system is that you know we still support coal burning companies, we think that change is a long term thing. It's unlikely on their side to even get change in the first place due to the likelihood of un being unable to even pass bills in the Senate. But we think that being in the in the majoritarian uh, um party, it's likely that you are able to first raise these issues up and use your political capital to then moderate, um, to then sway in like, you know, the moderate voters in order to opt for a better tomorrow, right? We think that this is how, this is how you actually, um, this is how you actually push for a change. So even if they want to say that, um, even if they want to say that youth will be oppressed in the current party, we don't think that's the case because at least we allow the incumbent leadership to know of these views in the first place and we slowly use our political capital by joining the party, by um, by joining the party um, to, to spread these beliefs, right? And I think that's extremely important uh, to, to talk about. And they want to talk about things such as like, you know, single, single issue voters, right? Because I think it's coming too late on the negative because they never talked about like, you know, forming your, your own party and, and rallying on single issues because like, note, note that all these youth mayors can, can actually happen on outside of the house, right? They will then have to prove, um, yeah, they will then have to prove why, um, they will then have to prove why being on the side of the income is more harmful than having, you know, new mayors with complete, you know, with no backing, no backing, no resources on their side of the house, right? And single issue voters are actually very difficult to vote for. So I think for all that reasons, I'm very proud to stand on. I'd like to thank the third negative speaker for their speech and to finally to conclude the case of the negative bench, let's now call it a negative reply. Here, here. Hi, am I audible? Yes. All right, just give me a sec. Fresh out of the Singaporean general elections of 2020, where a party like PAP actually got only 63% of the votes, but was still able to get 83 out of 93 seats in house, can actually tell you how these traditionally empowered parties have utilized resources such as gerrymandering to their advantage, which is enough to prove that like a youth faction is never going to be able to create a goddamn dent within these particular parties' establishment because they are seen as being the national fabric, because they are seen as being visionary, something which we received no response to from side of our and I think sufficiently harms their case because it's the premise of the characterization on which these traditionally empowered parties are based. Adjudicator, when you judge this debate, recognize that it exists on a comparative, which means in a debate that talks about standing rightly for your principle and getting maybe most change in the long run versus actually fighting from within the system, you have to see two things. One, which side is actually able to prove their mechanism to you better? And two, whose arguments are more persuasive, right? Let me start with the second one, which whose arguments are more persuasive? Recognize we had a lesser burden because we were 
actually able to quote status quo and tell you that it is more likely that the youth can work from within these parties to actually get change, right? We told you things like these particular people actually getting changes within like certain liberal parties for climate change by bringing in scientists to appease voters and actually convince them with the veneer of legitimacy of the main parent political party in and of itself, right? We think on their side of the house, the only thing that comes from them in terms of policy and mechanization is in third affirmative, where they tell you that, ah, oh, we can have like mayors and like AOC and like all of these sorts of people who can have small, small representation for us. And apart from that, the examples that they give you are all people who are actually part of democratic parties like Bernie Sanders himself, right? And I think that sufficiently harms their case because they then have to prove is by these particular mayors or by these particular single issue people being a part of an already established political party that we told you has certain benefits like utilizing funds, like utilizing their particular establishment, like utilizing their voter base by using their name, by using their legitimacy. Why all those things are bad? And the only response that we have to this throughout the bench is ah, principle. The principle is that these particular political parties are likely to be seen as sleeping with the enemy. Insofar as we respond to you in second and third negative in two ways where we tell you your principle does not stand the moment these are unfair democracies and you actually need to fight within the system, you will achieve absolutely nothing by going against the system for reasons such as negative partisanship because you will be seen as alien, because you will be seen as a threat, because you will be seen as somebody who is outright rejecting these particular parties. It's at that point in time when we think we take this clash away based on the policy, based on the mechanization. We are very clear with how we function, right? We want these people to be part of youth faction. Just look at status quo and fact to say that the PAP actually became more LGBTQ friendly because youth factions within that particular party were the ones who were able to convince the main political party to actually garner change. It was not an opposition party that was headed by the youth. This debate is about the youth. You cannot let them get away with examples of independent candidates and about political parties being single issue voters who are not absolutely a part of the youth in and of itself because these youth are people who are being seen as punks who are being seen as hot-blooded and whatnot, which is a characterization we give you, which they have no response to. They tell us that there are 60% of youth voters in India who are likely to vote for Modi. I tell you why the fuck they haven't then. It's simply because Modi is seen as being the all-knowing, a visionary leader, somebody who can actually have change. Progress on our side is gradual. Rome wasn't built in a day and that is the sort of thing which we essentially stand for, right? Because we tell you that actually having a bargaining chip within these parties, actually saying that after you fuck us up when we are within your political parties, we now have an incentive to actually move away from these parties is something which is very, very important, right? The sort of principle that they stand for is the exact reason why you're not able to achieve consensus within these particular democracies, why you're not able to actually compromise and whatnot, right? And that is essentially very important for this debate, something that we run as a principle which goes completely completely responded to from side affirmative based on the policy because they are so uncomparative and actually saying how they're going to achieve all the changes on their side of the house. We think we then take this debate in and of itself, right? All the harms that they bring to you in attacking our case also apply to their case. The difference is that these particular traditional parties will be more hostile towards your youth factions for the characterizations we give you because we are the ones that actually mechanize the policy and infighting is probably the best way to go about these parties. Extremely proud to oppose. I'd like to thank the negative reply for your speech. And to finally, to conclude the round, let's um, welcome now the proposition reply. Please. Here, here. Can I be heard? Yes. Cool. OK. In this speech, I'm going to do three things. First, discuss discourse. Secondly, discuss non-discourse policy. And thirdly, I'm going to look at the marginal change of both teams. Firstly, discourse. Their point was that you will be called a youth punk and get shit on by adults. But what I think you miss out on is why this won't happen when you use party resources and filibuster in Senate and use the veneer of legitimacy to speak up against Joe Biden when these, as demonstrated by first AFS material, go against the interests and incentives of the old in the party. Not just that you are legitimate, even if you are legitimate, if you still criticize them, either they still have all the same incentives to shit on you. But I think broadly, for a third neck to say, 
we just had this course is a bit of a disappointment because we that literally ignores all the building we had for it. We said three points. The first was that the party will eventually change. And I'm literally quoting from both first and second half. And for you to shake your head is a bit disingenuous. The second thing is this, uh, it forces big parties to adjust. Like literally their point on neg was, do you want to force parties to cater to you? The point was that if you leave, now that they can't count on your vote, they'll be forced to shift policy. And the third thing is that this forces people to talk about this thing, these things. And I think they downplay the power of discourse in society. Knowing how people are informed about policy changes how people vote, changes what things people are likely to prioritize. And again, you're shaking your head despite the fact that you haven't responded to this. So we win the discourse point quite clearly because them explaining that you shit on these kids is not a justification as for why the screen time, media, and air time isn't a good thing for many of these people. So we won discourse. Secondly, on non-discourse policy. And man, it is just so frustrating for us to spend time building a policy then for them to say at neg block, we only had our policy at third half and that we only had principle. Uh, I do think this was a genuinely good debate. And for them to say that we literally had nothing is a bit of a disappointment. What did we say? Again, just to repeat. One, in cases where you did not like the existing traditional parties, we were willing to support independent parties. So it's not sufficient for, third, uh, for neg reply to say it's not part of the debate since that was literally the model. Secondly, we propose to you a model of incremental support for the most important policies, both through lobbying and rallying, as well as advocating for seats in local Congress and in the House of Representatives, which were all forms of incremental change, exactly what Neg was defending. But the third and last and also most important thing was, in cases where you could not do any of these things, we would advocate for structural reforms outside the boundaries of the party. These are all ways that we could get non-discursive change. But the last thing, and I think this is crushing, they say that the youth are a very big block in society. And since we both agree that winning this debate was based on how many supporters you have, there is no proof from NEG for why literally if all the youth vote and shift into one party, they won't just shit on the existing traditional parties, especially if they're going to be so important in the future. They say, why is Narendra Modi still in power? Maybe because we haven't done this policy yet, guys. Like That's why we advocate for this policy. So the last thing is why they didn't have change. And I agree that they have some points about incremental change. And I do concede that they'll get some meaningful change when it comes to incremental discourse or when it comes to working within the policy. I don't think they said nothing. But what I don't think they do is answer a compelling problem we present, which is that society doesn't need centrist incremental solutions right now, but it needs to point us in the direction of radicalism. We presented to you four compelling problems, all of which needed an independent response to be deconstructed. First on automation, second on the failing economy, third on COVID, and fourth on climate change. Uh, uh, admittedly, we use most examples from climate change. But broadly speaking, all these problems required a radical solution that could not be solved with just working within the confines of the PAP's policy or the Democrats' policy. That's why we needed incremental change towards a radical solution, not one towards a solution everyone could agree upon. Lastly, though, again, just want to reiterate, they cannot get any of these solutions or benefits because literally their model was, we won't speak out to the degree where you get shit on. So if doing any of these policies or speaking up against corporations gets you shit on, they can't claim any of these benefits. For these reasons, don't believe Neg. It's actually a really good debate. So everyone gets high tabs, but we do crush them with the weight of them not responding to our preemptions. For these reasons, we are proud to affirm. Thank you. I'd like to thank the proposition's uh, reply for their speech. Thank you very much, debaters.